We now move to First Minister's questions. Question number one, Joanne Lamont. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister what engagements he has planned for the rest of the day. First Minister. Uh, engagements to take forward the, the Government's programme for Scotland. Joanne Lamont. Thank you. Presiding Officer, the First Minister and I can agree on two things. Sir Ian Wood is the preeminent expert on North Sea oil, and Sir Ian doesn't have much time for politicians. Yesterday, he reluctantly entered the referendum debate, saying he did so as a father and a grandfather, and saying he didn't want future generations to ask why he stood silent. He warned the Scottish Government had overestimated oil and gas production by between 45% and 60%. He warned the First Minister had overestimated oil tax revenue by £2,000 million a year. Is Sir Ian Wood right, or would the First Minister care to explain to him, his children, grandchildren and the generations to come why he is wrong? First Minister. Well, I hope that Joanne Lamont and I can agree on more than two things. Uh, we agree, as I remember, it just two weeks ago that uh, Scotland had the potential to be a prosperous, independent country. I think everybody uh, uh, agreed with that in this chamber. But let me agree that Ian Wood is an authority on North Sea oil and gas. He's not the only authority, of course. Uh, Professor Alec Kemp, uh, Sir Donald Mackay, these are also major authorities uh, in oil and gas. But I, I think what Ian Wood has to say on matters should be considered very carefully indeed. But can I just point out to, to Joanne Lamont that the, the figure that I've often quoted of up to 24 billion barrels of oil and gas equivalent remaining in the North Sea is not a Scottish Government figure at source. It was the figure that the industry produced, has produced for a number of years, and I think is a robust figure. It shows the extraordinary potential that remains in the waters around Scotland if indeed the policies are pursued and the stewardship is correct to make sure that these resources work for the Scottish people. Yeah, yeah. Joanne well, I think there's, there's two things. The First Minister recognised that Sir Ian Wood is an authority, but if he says something he doesn't want to hear, he simply ignores it. That is not good enough. And secondly, secondly, I would have imagined that Sir Ian Wood knew exactly what the First Minister said about these figures. He's offering a critique that we must address. The First Minister has rightly praised Ian Wood in the past, and it is for the public to judge why he disagrees with him now. Sir Ian said, and I quote, relevant to Scotland's independence debate is how long offshore oil and gas production will last. He said, and I quote, young voters, young voters must be fully aware that by the time they are middle-aged, Scotland will have little offshore oil and gas production, and this will seriously hit our economy, jobs and public services. So can the First Minister tell our children and grandchildren why Sir Ian Wood was wrong to give them that warning? First Minister. My headline message for the youth of today, get involved. The North Sea oil industry will see you through your lifetime. Ian Wood, BBC, 9th November 2012. Uh, yes, of course, Ian Wood is an authority yeah. on North Sea oil and gas, and he has been foremost in pointing out the future potential of the oil and gas province. Now, what Ian Wood, I listened to Ian Wood uh, today on the radio, uh, and he said, and I think he was right to do so, because Alec Kemp is a foremost authority in terms of the modelling of North Sea oil and gas and what remains. He said he'd spoken to Professor Alec Kemp over the last few days and he felt that the figure of 15 to 16.5 billion barrels was a, an appropriate estimate. Incidentally, that is, compares with the OBR estimate of 10 billion over the next 30 years, which in my calculation, that's 60% higher than, than the one offered uh, by the agencies of Her, Her Majesty's Government. Uh, but he said he'd been speaking to Professor Alec Kemp over uh, the last few days. And so I consulted Professor Alec Kemp's website, University of Aberdeen. Here, I've got it here. And that's absolutely correct. Uh, Professor Alec Kemp and Linda Stephen, his research partner, have conducted substantial modelling and a potential long-term recovery for oil and gas. It goes on to make certain projections and says, if targeted tax incentives were introduced to economic recovery to 2050 could increase to 15 to 16.5 billion of barrel of oil equivalent. And then it goes on, and it's now available on the University of Aberdeen website. 
but there is potential for further developments after 2050 yeah. if other fields can be rendered economically viable. Professor Kemp and Linda Stephen found at the year 2050 no less than 125 known existing discoveries remain undeveloped. Ah. With further progress in oil prices, this should Order, apply to let new us hear discoveries the first for future application. And finishes, thus the ultimate potential of 24 billion barrels of oil equivalent foreseen by Oil & Gas UK appears plausible. Right. So now we have yes. a point of agreement. Yes. 16.5 billion barrels to 2050 Which and up to 24 billion barrels as the total value Region of the oil team. province. Listen, Could that's a lot been. of billions of barrels and Scotland should yeah. welcome it. Joanne Lamont. Ms. L Ms. Lamont. Well, that'll give a lot of confidence to people who are worrying about the future. Because obviously... The first minister, the first minister said, the first minister said he listened to Sir Ian Wood. He didn't hear, or he willfully refused to hear what he was saying. And you should reflect on the fact that Sir Ian Wood said that he felt obliged to intervene in this debate because he was frustrated at being misrepresented and misquoted. And that is an example, a hallmark of a First Minister's approach to persuading people to support his lifelong political project. Say whatever has to be said to get by the moment, but ignore the substance of the argument. But in his warning, in his warning, Sir Ian Wood envisaged, far from an independent Scotland exporting energy to the rest of the United Kingdom, Scotland having to import from the rest of the United Kingdom. He said, he said, this preeminent expert, as identified by the First Minister, said, Unfortunately, I think Scotland will also lose out on renewables. The UK is currently heavily subsidising a renewable energy pricing. He added of the oil industry, he added of the oil industry, most operators... Let us hear Ms Lamont, please. This is about the future of our country. Yeah. Not the future Order. of the political project. He added of the oil industry. Most operators would feel more confident if Scotland was to remain part of the UK. So I ask the First Minister again, why was Ian Wood wrong to say that in the interests of our children, our grandchildren and the generations to come? Yeah, yeah. First Minister. Well, I, I've already pointed out that Sir Ian Wood is on the record saying the North Sea industry addressing the youth <coughs> of Scotland will see you through your lifetime. And he's right to say so. Because 2050 is not the limit of the oil industry. It will go on long beyond that. Now, I, well, John Lambert says I'm misquoting uh, uh, Ian Wood, but I've, I've got the transcript of his interview this morning. I spoke to Alec Kemp two or three times recently, and he's pretty clear of the view that right on, you know, the 15 to 16.5 billion that I have quoted is probably the right sort of range. Now, that is exactly the point I was making. Yes, Alec Kemp says 15 to 16.5 billion up to 2050. He then goes on to say it will be up to 24 billion if you take the full future a resource in the reserve. So this poor, benighted country of Scotland, yes. with only 16.5 billion of oil up to 2050, worth one trillion pounds in wholesale value over that period, or perhaps if we go on longer, only 1.5 trillion, trillion a thousand billion. This poor, benighted country visited with a great curse of 15 billion <laughs> barrels of oil. Every other country in the world would give their eye teeth yeah. for such a exactly. substantial resource. Yeah. So why do the Labour Party and the Labour Party's allies think it is a great curse on Scotland? And incidentally, having 25% of the offshore renewable energy potential of the continent of Europe, that's also an asset, not a disadvantage for an independent Scotland. Joanne Lamont. Order. Ms Lamont. United country, it is not. It is a wonderful, oh. wonderful... Oh. It is... 
a wonderful country that deserves not to have his intelligence insulted by that kind of response. It's not a debating point between me and the First Minister. It is what a senior person in the oil industry is saying is about the future of our country. So let's review the record over the last two years. The First Minister said he had EU legal advice. That wasn't true. John Swinney... Order. Carry on, Ms Lamont. It has been established beyond peradventure that that wasn't true. John Swinney said he was in discussions with the Bank of England on a currency union, and that wasn't true. Nicola Sturgeon told the SNP conference in April this year that under devolution, the NHS in Scotland couldn't be privatised. That is true, but now Alex Salmond says it isn't. Scotland, Scotland, Scotland. Order. We'll get through this a lot quicker if the applauding and the jeering will stop. Miss Lamont, this is your last question. Will you just get to it? Well, we would get a lot... Well, let me hope in all optimism you get an answer to the question. Yeah. Scotland's greatest oil expert says independence would be bad for Scotland and he's derided by his own First Minister. Isn't it the case Alex Salmon doesn't have a plan B on currency, he doesn't have a plan B on Europe, he doesn't have a plan B on oil? The trouble is that it's the case that Scotland doesn't trust Alex Salmon because he's the man without a plan. Yeah. First Minister. Order. Can, First Minister. Can I, can I just put it on the record that Sir Ian Wood, as I said in answer to the first question, the respected authority, as is Sir Alec Kemp, eh, as are the range of, of experts like Sir Donald Mackay, who have analysed the Scottish Government figures and produced their own estimates, which are very similar indeed to the projections of the Scottish Government. They say that uh, the UK Treasury is missing a mountain of black gold. I pointed out the 24 billion up to 24 billion figure is an industry estimate. It's been used by many, many people, including the Wakewood Review. I've pointed out that this 16 billion barrels is up to 2050, and Alec Kemp, the foremost authority on that area of the oil industry, says there's more to come, and the 24 billion looks entirely uh, plausible. But on the question of the health service, it can't perhaps, if John Lamont can't bring herself to agree with me, how about agreeing with Unison? Unison, the union. Devolution means they can't run down and privatise our NHS directly from London, the way they are doing in England. But what they can do is starve it of resources. They are cutting back on the money provided to the Scottish Government and putting the Scottish budget under pressure. Unison, the union. But then, of course, there is the question Order. of what John asked me about uh, whether or not who's to blame for what. I was struck and encouraged and excited uh, by uh, Ian Davidson's comments of only this week. He identified that Labour's failure was the reason for the SNP's success and spoke out. The reasons why the SNP have done so well in recent years has more to do with the failures of the Labour Party, the lack of modernisation. The SNP have become what the Labour Party should have been. His argument was that Scottish voters moved from Glasgow to the new towns of Scotland. Many of them became SNP supporters. They didn't want the Tammany Hall politics of Labour. <laughs> Now, Order, can we, we get, get a conclusion, the First Minister? That I am able to quote Ian Davidson against Joanne Lamont, then perhaps the reality is that the Labour Party in Scotland don't have a plan A, never mind a plan B. Order. Order. Question two, Ruth Davidson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister when he'll next meet the Prime Minister. Uh, no plans near future. Ruth Davidson. Thank you. Sir Ian Woods is the most respected business figure in the North Sea oil industry. And for two and a half years in this debate, he has kept his own counsel. He has stayed studiously neutral. As he said yesterday, he had no wish to get involved. Now, I've just heard all of the chaff that the First Minister has been firing out to deflect from Sir Ian's critique yesterday. But what I haven't heard 
And what I'm asking the First Minister is this. Why does he think Sir Ian now feels so compelled to speak out? First Minister. Well, Sir Ian Wood wanted to clarify that his opinion was that the, the oil reserves Order. were between 15 to 16.5 billion. That was his likely estimate. I'm pointing out that I think that is based on the forecasts of Alec Kemp, Professor Alec Kemp, who points out today in this Aberdeen University blog that that applies up to 2050. There are already oil fields in the West Coast which are going to produce beyond 2050. Alec Kemp has identified over 100 oil discoveries that are not in the calculations to 2050. And he and many industry figures believe that therefore the overall value in terms of reserves of the oil province is up to 24 billion, which is the industry estimate that UK oil and gas have. But you know, UK oil and gas, individual companies, here is a briefing from British Petroleum from Tim Smith, the Vice President of British Petroleum, to MSPs last year. 41 billion barrels produced to the end 2012. Potentially 27 billion barrels of resource yet to recover production beyond 2050. So if the industry estimate is up to 24, if major companies are saying 27, can Ruth Davis not bring herself to realise that whether it's 16.5 billion to 2050, whether it's 27 billion beyond 2050, that's many, many billions of barrels of oil and in wholesale terms worth many trillions of pounds. Every country in the world would believe that is an enormous asset. Why do the Tories and the Labour Party alone believe it's an extraordinary liability? Ruth Davidson. Uh, well, with all due respect to the First Minister, that's not why Sir Ian says he felt the need at this critical time to speak out. Sir Ian has no worlds left to conquer. He's not trying to win any votes. He just wants the Scottish people to know the facts before they make this irreversible decision. Now, throughout this whole debate, the First Minister has twi twisted facts and ducked hard truths and simply closed his ears to anything that doesn't fit his lifelong obsession of independence. But not everybody out there is like that. People want to know what is best for their children and their grandchildren. So can't the First Minister, can't the First Minister just have the decency, even at this late stage, to concede Sir Ian's point that our young voters must be fully aware that by the time they are middle-aged, Scotland will have little offshore oil and gas production and this will seriously hit our economy jobs and public services. A direct quote from Sir Ian, will he not concede it? First Minister. Well, I think she, she checks the record, she'll find that even her boss, the Prime Minister, hasn't said that on the contrary. I already read out Ian Wood's rallying call to the youth of Scotland, saying that somebody could enter the oil industry and the North Sea would last them an entire lifetime. For goodness sake, don't misquote. This is an important argument. <laughs> Important argument about the one. Order, settle down. Can we actually get to a position that Alec Kemp is cited as the as the person relied upon in terms of forecast, and in his forecast blog today points out there's 125 known existing discoveries, which in these estimates will still be undeveloped in 2050, when the Clare Ridge field is already going to produce beyond 2050. Can Ruth Davis I not admit this is a long-term business that will be with us for generations to come? Ruth Davidson, over the past, will know that major figures in the Westminster government have now admitted they rather underestimated the significance of oil and gas. Dennis Healy, we underplayed the value of the resource. Bernard Ingham, it was part of his normal pattern to question the value of the resource. Given the history and track record of Westminster, is it not possible that her government, with her 10 billion barrel estimate over the next 30 years, are doing exactly the same thing? Given the evidence in the last 40 years, then I think most people in Scotland will say, let's get our turn of using our natural resources for the benefit of the Scottish people. Question number 
three. Order. Question number three, Duncan McNeill. <coughs> to ask the, the First Minister how the Scottish Government will ensure the future of shipbuilding in the, on the Lower Clyde. First Minister. On Tuesday, I met with the Ferguson shop stewards. Uh, I spoke to them again this morning. Tomorrow, I will visit the shipyards itself to speak to the employees, where I will reiterate the Scottish Government's commitment to the future of the yard and to their employment. Uh, as uh, Duncan McNeill knows, a multi-agency task force has been convened by the Cabinet Secretary. It is due to have its next meeting on Monday. And I can assure everyone in this chamber the Scottish Government is doing, will do, everything within our power to ensure the continuation of shipbuilding at Ferguson's. Can I, can I thank the First Minister for his response? And I'm sure, like me, he's encouraged by the number of bidders that uh, I've already declared and have expressed serious interest in the continuing shipbuilding at Ferguson's, and which demonstrates quite clearly a confidence in the yard, the workforce and the future, and will be good news in a bad week for the people of Port Glasgow and indeed the Inverclyde community. Although we all express a very serious regret that the yard with such potential was allowed to close. A closure that was brought about by the failure of Carmack and the assets management company CMAL to place orders for ferries three and four, following the very successful build Can of MV Hallack and MV Lock and Var. It is the stated position, and I don't question it, of the Scottish Government that they wish to continue commercial shipbuilding in the lower Clyde at Ferguson's. Is the First Minister confident that his view is shared by CMAL uh, and Carl Mack? And how will he ensure the requirement for 12 new vessels and the £240 million of public investment will be used in support of Ferguson's and the wider Scottish economy? First Minister. You know, when John Swinney made his statement on Tuesday, I, I did think Duncan Neal struck the, the wrong note in terms of how to analyse this situation. There have been substantial orders placed with this yard and substantial opportunity to give him the, the new generation of environmentally uh, sensitive ferries. And we have great hopes uh, that we will arrive at a situation uh, where that uh, can continue under new ownership. Duncan Neal says what encourages me. Two things encourage me greatly. One is the, the spirit and determination of the workforce in Ferguson's. One thing has been unanimous uh, from every commentator uh, around this issue, that no one has questioned the skill, the dedication, the application and the resilience and resolve of that workforce. And every single person in this chamber should give them absolutely maximum support. That encourages me greatly. The second thing is I was encouraged by the statement of the receiver yesterday. Uh, because he made it quite clear, uh, Blair Nibble, that he was moving to an early uh, deadline in terms of offers to be analysed of five o'clock this evening. And in that statement, he said he was moving to that deadline because he wanted to make sure that there was the chance of a continuation of Ferguson's as an ongoing concern. Uh, he would be particularly looking at holding this workforce together and making sure there are prospects for the future. So I think, although we are not there yet, Although there are going to be still be more anxious hours and anxious days for the workforce at Ferguson's, that we have reason for substantial encouragement. And that encouragement is founded and based not just on the determination of this government and the support of everyone in this chamber, but the resolve and the resilience of the shipyard workers themselves. Question four, John Wilson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister what the Scottish Government's response is to the final report by the Commission on Strengthening Local Democracy. First Minister. Well, we welcome it. Uh, independence provides the opportunity to empower councils, communities to consider the right level for all decisions to be made as we have set out our prospectus for Scotland's island communities. Local government will be an integral and essential element of an independent Scotland. Its status, in my estimation, can only be guaranteed by a written constitution after independence. John Wilson. Presiding officer, I thank the First Minister for his reply. The First Minister is aware that this report follows the previous report in 2012 by the Jimmy Reid Foundation, The Silent Crisis, Failure and Revival in Local Democracy in Scotland. Does the First Minister agree with me that the only way that we can truly get a democratic society in Scotland is by voting yes on the 18th of September to ensure that Westminster governments do not interfere in the democratic structures that we want to see in a future Scotland. First Minister. I agree with that position. But 
the point of John Wilson's question, I think, is very opposite. There are a range of vital institutions uh, which could, with a written constitution, have entrenched protection, which are part of the fabric and vital fabric of, of Scotland. That is one of the benefits of having a written constitution. Uh, we recently had the, the Commonwealth Games in the city of Glasgow, and a fantastic success it was. 71 nations and territories competing in these games. With the exception of New Zealand, which has a basic law, which is a, a very important aspect, every single one of these independent countries has a written constitution which preserves and protects the rights of their citizens, as well as enunciating free rights. I agree with John Wilson that the position of local government would be entrenched in a written constitution in an independent Scotland. Question five, Neil Findlay. To ask the First Minister how the Scottish Government's economic strategy, strategy will help achieve the aims of its our growth declaration of opportunity. First Minister. Well, uh, as I set out in our broth, only independence uh, offers the opportunity to release the vast potential of top Scotland's extraordinarily talented population. Last week, we published our jobs plan for independent Scotland which shows through how independence we can create more and better job opportunities, helping our young people to realise their aspirations and ambitions here in Scotland. It does seem to me that while we offer a declaration of opportunity, Neil Finlay and, of course, his colleagues in the Conservative Party have nothing whatsoever to declare. Neil Finlay. We now know that the First Minister's oil forecasts are a mere 60 per cent out and that his corporate tax gift to big business would rip £350 million a year from our public services. Will the First Minister now accept that it's, his, that it's his voodoo economics that would see a separate Scotland with an £8.6 million black hole in its finances? And will he apologise to what cancer Order. specialist Dr Anna Gregor says is the complete and utter lie about NHS privatisation in the event of a no vote? First Minister. Well, uh... I, I know it's uh, extremely difficult for the constituency member, given his alliance with the Conservative Party, to try and reflect on the position that lots and lots of people in Scotland uh, agree with the surge of support for protecting our national health service through independence for Scotland and within a written constitution. But he will have paid close attention to the quote I read out from Unison making the point that as the health service budget and public service budget is reduced in England, and he surely doesn't believe that privatisation is intended to increase the health service budget in England. As that happens, it will happen if enforced in Scotland as Unison identify through financial pressure. Now, luckily, of course, the SNP and John Swinney have been in administration, ensuring a real terms increase over the last few years in the National Health Service budget. But what has happened in Wales? A 3% decline. So either we believe that the Labour Party in Wales wanted to reduce real terms spending on the National Health Service, which even I don't believe, or we believe that it's been forced by the financial pressure from Westminster. Yeah. So I agree with the Labour Party in Wales. I agree with the Labour Party in England that England's privatisation through the Tories is endangering the health service. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I agree with Eunice, and it's high time the member did as well. Yeah. Question number six. Order. Order. Question six. Jim Eady. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister what progress has been made in reducing cancer mortality rates. First Minister. Uh, we welcome the figures released by Cancer Research UK on Monday, the 18th of August, showing that mortality rates in the four main cancers in Scotland have reduced by around 25% in the last 20 years. We are working with Cancer Research UK in a number of areas, and we endorse their new strategy aimed at pushing cancer survival to three and four within the next 20 years. In recent years, we have been investing to improve Scotland's cancer treatment infrastructure, including £22 million for the new Beetson Centre, now being built at uh, Monklands Hospital, to help meet the rising demand for radiotherapy treatment over the next 10 years. Jimmy D. I thank the First Minister for that answer. 
While improved specialist care, better treatments and fewer people smoking have all contributed to the fall in the death rates from the top four cancer killers, does the First Minister agree that the health and equality gap between the lowest and highest deprivation groups is still far too high for too many cancers, including lung, cervix and stomach cancer, and that programmes that help detect cancer at the earliest stage are absolutely vital to ensuring that everyone in Scotland receives the life-saving treatment they need, which only a publicly funded and clinically driven health service can provide? First Minister. Well, yes, I do, and that's why the government have targeted £30 million investment into early cancer detection through the Detect Cancer Early programme, and invested a further £12 million to modernise the Scottish Breast Screening programme. In addition to screening, the Detect Cancer Early programme focuses on addressing fears about cancer, on recognising signs and symptoms of cancer, encouraging people to get checked if they're worried, and we know that diagnosis and treatment at the earlier stage helps to improve survival rates. This will ensure that every patient, regardless of where they live, receives timely treatment and follow-up. Jimmy D mentions the importance of a public health service. I hope that everyone in this chamber understands the importance of protecting and preserving our national health service in Scotland. It is absolutely vital. We believe that can be done through Scottish independence. If there is an alternative route to do it, then it better get spelled out. But the Labour Party members should remember Order. What Ian Davidson's words at this First Minister's questions, the SNP have become what the Labour Party should have become. That ends First Minister's questions. We now move to members' business. Members who leave in the chamber should do so quickly and quietly.